um, of repentance, which it can be, but it's also a place of, of just worshiping the Lord and being alone with the Lord or during the time of singing. And, um, but one of the things I was thinking about this morning was just throughout like the Old Testament, um, just the times of when an altar was created, um, that it wasn't just for sacrifice for sin. Um, so I was thinking about specifically about Noah because there's a lot of different examples. Um, but in Genesis 8, uh, verse 20, um, and so right after the, they had gotten, um, the Lord had cleared all the waters after the flood and they, the, the ark had landed and they had set out the dove and, and had come back and then they realized that there was land, they were on land and the waters receded. Um, in verse 20, it says, um, then Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on that altar. And the Lord, and this is the best part, because this is the part of like what we desire here. And I pray, like we were just praying before service and our desire even during worship is that, that not just that we're here singing songs and we're not, you know, singing it right, making it sound good, which is great, but that our, our singing and our worship would be incense before the Lord, that it would be sweet to his ears, sweet to his nostrils, that he would like, that he would love it. And he would love, to, uh, you know, that there would just be a communion there between us. Like, you know, if you picture, uh, talks about in the, in the Old Testament about the angels going up and down from heaven uh, with Jacob. And if you just think of that, like this, what's happening here is like, we're just in the, in the presence of the Lord. There's just a communion happening during this time of worship. So it says, um, and after he'd offered the burned offerings on the altar, in verse 21, and the Lord smelled a sweet aroma. And the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing that I have done. God's heart is for us. He loves us. And just seen throughout the Old Testament, you know, all the things that man had to do in the physical to repent for what they had done and, and offer burnt offering. And, but God's, the, the new covenant is so sweet. And what God's plan was there is he was starting that, just seeing like, I'm not, I have a love for you, it's such a great love for you, that I won't ever wipe these people out again because I have a better plan coming. And this place and this altar is a place of not just repentance, like I was saying before, but it's a place of offering up a heart of thanksgiving. And so this morning, and I said this before, think of what the Lord's done in your life. Think of what he saved you from, what he's brought you out of. If you, you know, maybe you lived a life that was good or you maybe lived like before, in, you know, eyes of the world, a life that was good or a life that was just absolute destruction where you're, you know, it says he picked me up of a, out of a miry pit of, you know, just the disgustingness of my flesh where maybe you're a drunk or, uh, or, or into drugs or anything, or maybe you just, we're a liar and a cheat or whatever, you know, is whatever that, whatever the Lord brought you out of, praise him this morning. Praise him for what he's done in your life. Praise him for the victories. Praise him for the trial you're going through right now because there's victory on the other side. Praise him that, that he loves us and he cares for us, that he died for us. Don't let the enemy get into your heart and lie to you this morning and say, I don't have anything. There's really nothing that the Lord's done for me. There's something. And that heart of thanksgiving is gonna turn into a heart of worship. So I encourage you this morning, come here, lay aside how you feel and maybe, you know, just being awkward, just come up here and worship the Lord this morning.
There's a truth that's more than all I feel I set my hope on Jesus I set my hope on Jesus I rock my only trust Who set his heart
Is true 
when we receive it by faith is the end of us thinking have we done enough for God are we good enough well the answer is yes because he's imputed to us he's charged us with his righteousness and that's the end of striving it's the end of earning but it's not the end of coming it's not the end of coming to receive all that he has for us in Christ Jesus amen thank you worship team praise God Hallelujah. Thank you for working on that new song. I uh, love that song. We'll work it out. We'll, we'll get it worked out. And it, it's a beautiful song. Hallelujah. Well, we have some announcements, Ann. Oh, I want to just say, how many of you were praying for Israel last night? How many of you heard about over 300 combined rockets, drones, ballistic missiles, surface to surface missiles were sent by Iran? And Praise God, 99% of the missiles and all, all that salvo was stopped. It didn't end up uh, really creating great damage. One 10-year-old girl was injured and is in the hospital. We should pray for her. But let's just thank God to start this service. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you're protecting Israel. Thank you, God, that, Lord, though the majority of natural Israel still hasn't come to faith in you, Lord, they're still, they're still yours. They're still your firstborn. And Lord, we're asking in Jesus' name for a miracle that your spirit would grant them grace to see the Savior. Grant them a belief, Lord. Grant them taking away of the veil of blindness over their hearts. That they could see the one that they pierced. And mourn for him as for an only son. And come to Christ, Lord. Your word promises this will happen in the last days. That you will gather the remnant of Israel to yourself. And so all Israel shall be saved. So we bless you today in your name. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Um, it's always crazy when you get up here and all of a sudden the seats are full. It's exciting. Okay, sorry. That's my little excitement for the morning. Um, we have prayer tonight at 6 p.m. And then Wednesday night Bible study is 7 p.m. Thursday evening we have youth and young adults still at the Skiro's house at 7 p.m. Saturday morning at 9 a.m. is our church, all church cleaning day. So if you can make it, we'd love it. Um, we have lots to do. There's going to be a list, and Chrissy's going to delegate that list for us all. And lunch will be served, yes. So you don't have to worry. And donuts, prob probably. <laughs> um, okay, and then the 21st is our lunch fellowship after church, if you're new here or just started coming here, on one Sunday a month we have lunch after service. Um, there's a sign-up sheet on the back counter. If you are able or willing to bring something, you can sign up for one of the items. And then we all, after service, go have lunch together in the fellowship hall. And it's just a good way to get to know each other, build on those relationships together, um, and just get to hear what God's done in each of our lives. So that is going to be this coming Sunday, the 21st. And again, the sign-up sheet is out in the hallway. And that is really it for this month. 
In May, we do have Lee Ship coming. Um, we have Shedrick coming. And then we will have our Memorial Day cookout lunch, uh, dinner this time. So that's all up and coming. Praise God. So uh, I want to just give you an opportunity to, to boast in Jesus. We call it testimony time or sharing time, but really it's a time to, to boast in what God's doing. Boast in what he's doing in your life, the prayers he's answered, the things you're seeing him move in. Um, so does anybody have something that they want to testify about? Mary. Good morning. <laughs> I'm going to boast and testify. Um, this week I got a really awesome email, but just a little backstory. I've been serving the Lord for over eight years now, and my life before was pretty crazy. Um, so it's, I wasn't going to sh- I, 20 years ago, 20 years ago, I ended up getting in trouble with the police, and I ended up getting a felony theft charge that's kind of been over my head for the last 20 years. And I'm just going to testify that he is just faithful to restore and just redeem everything. Two years ago, I um, applied for a pardon, and I had to get letters of recommendation. So my pastor, a few of my friends wrote letters to the court. And um, finally, this February, so a year and a half later, I heard that I was having a hearing. And I had a Zoom hearing while we were in Arizona, and it went really well. Um, I just shared the change, and I gave all the glory to the Lord. And then this week, I received an email that they, the pardon advisory board decided to send it to the governor, and the governor accepted the pardon. So my felony is forgiven, and all the consequences for it are restored. And it's just so beautiful, and it's just... I've just been thinking all week about what the Lord, what Jesus did for us. Like it's, I don't know, it's just overwhelming, but I'm just very grateful and it's wonderful. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, the, the change is real. It's not just a you know, jailhouse conversion. It's real. It's, it's lasting and it's continual. He's changing us, his continual. It's wonderful. He restores the years that the locusts have eaten and the cankerworm have eaten. He restores our soul. Praise God. It's wonderful. All right. Um, so on, hopefully I'm the only one, but work's been a little daunting lately and kind of came to a head on Monday. And it was just kind of trying to find what God was doing in that. And then all of a sudden, the day after on Tuesday, I had a uh, haircut with a lady I've been going to for a while now. And I had to reschedule last week because she had a COVID and everything else. And so it was just perfect that <laughs> tough day at work. And then on Tuesday, she's sharing about, you know, she's going through all this litigation with her daughter's father and all this other, sh I mean, she's just not doesn't have good friends that are encouraging her. So it was just like really nice to meet her where she was at. And it was like, you know, this is the life that they live. Like, of, you know, I didn't want to feel bad for myself and work because it was like, I have God, but you know, some people don't even have that opportunity. Like, of, of course I'm getting the tall finger in traffic. Like, I mean, they don't, they don't know this love. Like, it's just, it's just a little bit crazy to me. So it was really nice to just you know, share where she was at and try and encourage her. And, you know, and when I was at the men's retreat, Pastor Aaron was sharing about barns with the, the roofs that they have. If you let the shingles go too long, the entire thing is pretty much junk. And it was just like really special moment while I was meditating over the weekend and it's driving past barns in northern Wisconsin. It was like, I mean, that's that's pretty much our lives. Like, we we need to uphold the roof. Like, God's the roof. We need to put the work into give him the opportunity to shield us from hail, rain, and whatever else is coming. Like, of course this thing's gonna fall down if you don't put in the, the dedication to God. Good morning, beloved. Uh, I wanna share a few uh, spiritual lessons from a three-year-old. 
Um, so uh, we, um, we went to Great Wolf Lodge um, this week, and if any of you have ever dealt with a three-year-old boy, like, it's, it's wonderful to, to see, you know, just the innocence and, and the awe of their life, but there's just this, like, like come on, just, just walk, just get in the car, just, just something, right? <laughs> So we're like walking in between one part to the other part, and he is just in another world. Like he's just gone. And the Lord spoke to me about, you know, you, you must become like a little child. To see the kingdom of heaven, you must. And I'm like, he is in the kingdom of heaven in the sense. He's just, he's just walking. He's, he's in a water park but he is focused on something completely different that I have no ability to see. And, but me in my flesh, I'm like, you know, perturbed and wanting to control it. And it's just, that's what the flesh does to the spirit man, right? The spirit wants to walk in communion and look into the things of heaven constantly. And then my flesh is like, nope, come on, this, like, hurry this up, do this differently, you know? And, and, and so we, we ruin that in the sense, they showed me that, and then a little while later, we're um, in the big pool, and he's got his like little puddle jumper thing on there, so he can like, you know, I don't even have to hold him, he'd be floating, but he doesn't recognize that or won't hear that, but um, he's like, you know, he wants to hold on to me, and he's like, I'm swimming, I'm swimming, I'm swimming, he's like, yeah, buddy, that's, you know, what you're doing, sort of, you know, but then when I try to actually pull away from him, or, or try to go underwater so that he's above me, he's still on me, but I'm, I'm below him, and then he's you know, really getting what it means to swim, he starts freaking out. And I was just like, that's exactly what I do with God, right? I trust my Father in the things that I am, want to trust him in and can see him in, and, and, and you know, but as soon as he does something that I don't like, I instantly start questioning him and start you know, and, and getting in fear and, and anxieties and all these things, and so it's just like, just seeing this, like, this is what I do with the Lord so often, you know, and I, I just uh, confess to you, he, the Lord has me in a place, has for a long time, but just this, I have to be willing to go forward, and, and so often, uh, I'm praying things that the Bible tells me I've already done, right? Lord, put me to death. Well, no, I'm already dead, right? But he just spoke to me in the altar, this thing, this idea of buried alive, I'm buried with him, but I'm in this casket, and I'm six feet on the ground, yet I haven't submitted to that death, and so I'm sitting here fighting and trying to live something that I can't possibly live because I'm dead, and so I can't live and die at the same time, and so I'm hindering what the Lord is doing because of that very thing, but it was you know, kind of a picture of what Aiden's doing, like, I'm trying to teach you how to swim here, but you won't trust me enough to just understand. I didn't go anywhere. I'm, I'm still within arm's length. I'm not going to let you drown, yet you just won't submit to this and, and learn what you need to learn. So, so the, the Bible says, let the little children come to me. Right? Unless you're converted and become like little children, you shall not enter the kingdom of heaven. I, I was blessed today by a couple children. These our guests, the new kids, <laughs> that came up, that came up to, came up to the altar in the last song and just had their hands raised and were praising God. Hey, amen, amen. That's that's. I love to see that. Hey, I want to say to the rest of the children, uh, whether you're you're two or you're 13 or you're 17, or whatever. You're not a child if you're 17, but children, come to the altar. Come to the altar to pray. Come to the altar to worship. Come and raise your hands. Come and. Come in and, and experience the presence of God. So thank you for breaking the ice for the rest of the kids in the church. I'm going to go over here first. I'll come back to you, Nick. Um, I am not much for public speaking, so I'm going to do my best. Um, but I feel like God is wanting me to share this. So um, anxiety and control is something that I've always really struggled with in my life. And I've been a Christian, I would say, my whole life. But one thing that I feel like God has really been showing me lately is what it means to really come to him and receive rest. Um, we've been going through kind of a, a challenging season with a lot of sickness and just waiting on God to answer some prayers and um, just crazy busy and just everything that has been coming with life lately. And 
you know, I've been trying to really go to God, so I've been putting on worship music, and I've been trying to think about God, and trying to do all these things that I felt like was really going to help, you know, me going to God, and I felt like there was one day I was particularly triggered by something, and I felt like God was telling me, like, you know, you're going to the idea of me, but I want you to come to me, so just turned off my phone, put Kellen down for a nap, got on my knees, and just pictured myself at the feet of Jesus, and just the rest that he gave me was life-changing, really. Um, just some things I've been struggling with my whole life, finally getting peace from it. Um, and I know a lot of us have heard this verse before, but it just really hit me in a new way. Matthew 11, um, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle in heart and you will find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. And just how, how life-changing it is to come to the person of Jesus and spend time with him and let who he is as a person just fill you and change you. It's, I'm just really learning it's not about really what we're doing. It's coming to him kind of like Pastor and you were saying a little bit ago, just... The power in that has been really, really cool. I just, this is not a testimony, but this is rare. Uh, some of my family is here that this is unusual for us, but uh, down at the end is my old, our oldest daughter, Holly, who is her husband works up on the slope to keep your cars with gasoline, okay, up in Alaska. The slope, we call it the North Slope, up by Point Barrow and, you know, there's other, huh? Fruitville Bay, yeah. So Holly's with us today. She's sometimes in Wisconsin, sometimes in Alaska, back and forth. And then uh, my dear wife, Sally, whose birthday is tomorrow. I'll, yeah. She's a little bit younger than I am. Uh, I'll be 91 in three weeks. I won't her birthday, but and our our just this is Justin, my grandson, our middle grandson, his wife Kara, who lived in New Zealand till she was about 12. She's an Air Force Academy graduate, so she's thoroughly American now. And we have 10 great grandkids. Here's the uh, uh, Gracie, our grand, great granddaughter, and Gavin. So they're they're the youngest of the of the ten. The, the top is 14 and 15. So, and excuse us, we're going to bug out to get to have a breakfast birthday breakfast at uh, in Delphiel at 12:30. Tw so, if, if Aaron preaches for two hours, we'll be we'll be leaving. <laughs> I promise not to do that, Dick. It'll only be an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> no, <laughs> it won't be that long. Trust me. Hallelujah. Anyone else? Oh, we got a few others. Um, first of all, thank you to um, everyone in the church who was praying for my family who was ill this week. Um, it was a virus unlike anything we've experienced in several years. So thank you so much for your prayers, and we're so grateful to be here. Um, a few weeks back, Amanda shared a beautiful testimony of an experience in Walmart. Today I've got Walgreens. Um, spent many, um, many moments this week at Walgreens in the pharmacy line. And I was in the line, it was it, the longest line I've ever been in at this moment. There was five people in front of me, and a man had come, and now he was, he waited in a chair, and then he was behind me. And as soon as he got behind me, we could hear conversations up in the front, the people at the cashier talking to the pharmacist. And there was, he was very different than me, you know, culturally, um, age, etc. And the woman who was, we could hear her conversation, um, she was very different than us, culturally, everything. And he began whispering in my ear, because I was obviously his audience, according to him, um, very derogatory comments about her her conversation, what she was talking about, her ethnicity, where she, he assumed she was potentially from in the world. And it was ongoing, just, it was really um, grotesque. And I just said a prayer to the Lord. I said, Lord, help me 
to not let it end this way. I just took a breath. I have to face him. So I just turned to him and I said, how was your day going today? And he started talking about the traffic. And then he explained why he was there. He was getting a prescription for an upcoming surgery on his teeth. And he talked really fast. So a lot happened in a few minutes. But as he talked about his teeth and the situation and this long-term situation, he just was unveiling all these things about himself and emotionally. I said, okay, can I pray for you? Can I pray for your surgery? And his expression and his demeanor, he just, like, he, he just took a breath and he like, I saw his body like move back and then he said, no, it's good. I, no, 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 I have prayed about this. The surgery is going to be fine. I said, that's awesome, but, but can I pray for you? He said, you know, I really appreciate it. It's okay. I, God's got this. I'm going to be just fine. I said, okay, I just wanted you to know that I wanted to pray for you. And then it was my, the line had moved up and it was my turn to get in line. So I did my business. I turned around. He was still in line and I looked at him and I said, have a great day. And he said, God bless you. That's how it ended. That was my prayer. Lord, let this end differently. Let it not end in these grotesque comments that I'm hearing about this woman. It ended with the name of Jesus. And it was such a very simple act. And of course, we never boast in ourselves. It's what God did. It's such a small act. And I'm just so grateful that it ended in the name of Jesus. Glad you're back, glad you're feeling better. There's a lot of nasty things going around. I got something pretty cool to share. So a couple months ago, I met this kid at the gym. Uh, he's a senior in high school, and we kind of connected right away because we share some of the same interests. He wants to play college soccer. Uh, he's really into health, nutrition, and fitness, which is all I'm about. Um, so basically, I befriended him right away because he kind of reminds me of a younger version of myself. So I thought it would be the perfect opportunity to kind of mentor him and help kind of help him navigate the future because as a senior in high school, it's kind of, there's a lot of uncertainty and it's a pretty stressful time because you don't know what the future beholds. So I thought it'd be good to kind of, because I, I was in his shoes once and I felt like I could help him out in certain ways. So um, I started planting some seeds about my faith here and there. I got him a copy of God's Word. And um, I actually also got him a part-time job uh, where I work, and he went on a spring break trip um, backpacking in uh, North Carolina. And he comes back, and I guess he had a revelation during the trip. He comes into work, his eyes are all lit up, huge smile on his face, and he's like, Eric, bro, I have something to tell you. I think I'm a Christian now. <laughs> and I gave him the biggest bro hug in the world, and it was just super cool. So thought I'd share that with you guys. Praise God. I love that. You gave him a big bro hug at the end. <laughs> you know, this is what the gospel, this is what Christianity is about. We don't keep it to ourselves. We look for opportunities to share it and to love people and to, to bring them to the same glorious Savior that we know. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, um, we're going to take the offering. So, uh, Josh, could you come up here? Okay. I know Al is, is late. He had to work. You guys can distribute. I'll pray. This is your first time, and this is not your home church. Please don't feel any obligation to give. This is for people that consider Oxano Church their home church. And we consider giving uh, a, pri a privilege and an act of worship. And um, it's our way of saying, God, you've given us everything, even the power to, to make a living, to earn our, our, our wage and to have intelligence. And, and if you have success, guess what? God gave you the ability for that success. And so we just give back to him a small part of, of what he's given to us. So we consider it a privilege. So let's just pray for the offering. Father, we just thank you for the privilege to worship you through our giving, God. And Lord, it, with the Passover, you said, that none shall appear before me empty-handed. And so, God, we just thank you, Lord, that you provide so that our hands are not empty, so that we can both receive from you your goodness, be nourished, be strengthened, have food and shelter, and also give back to you for the work of God. So we thank you for this privilege. We give to you by faith in Jesus' name. Amen.
I'd also ask uh, ushers to come forward for communion. It's Communion Sunday with Evan and some of the men, Gabe, Dan, we need one more man, Eric. Eric, you want to come up? So we're going to hand out the elements. Just wait a second, guys. We're going to hand out the elements. And if you just all hold the elements until <clears throat> we're all served, we'll, take, we'll partake together. So, Lord, we just thank you for the privilege. We just ask you to help us prepare our hearts to, Lord, not just go through the motions, Lord, of, of, of something that you've called the church to do in perpetuity, to remember your death, to remember what you suffered for us. But, Lord, that we would do it with reverence and, and with a revelation of your spirit of what, of what you went through for us, of the love you poured out to forgive us, to, to claim us, to redeem us back to God. In Jesus' name, amen. So if you'd go ahead and hand out the elements, guys. When everybody is served, then we will uh, read a little scripture and pray together and, and partake of the elements. That's not the intention of the Lord's Supper. The intention of the Lord's Supper is to celebrate his death and resurrection. Celebrate our forgiveness through Christ. It says, but let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So God's not saying, I don't want you to participate. He's saying, I want you to participate, but I want you to make sure that your heart is right before me. Because we're celebrating the most awesome, reverent thing in all of creation. Sacrifice. 
face of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. So if there's any sin you need to confess, just bring it to the Lord right now in this time. Be washed, be cleansed. There's no probation period in the Lord. Be washed and be cleansed. And then give Him thanks. Give Him thanks and give Him praise. That His blood makes us white as snow. His blood makes us whiter than the whitest lamb, the whitest snow. His blood takes away all sin, all uncleanness. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. said in 1 Corinthians 11 23 it says for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said take eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me let's take the bread together took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes let's drink together Lord we thank you for your body that was broken for us to Redeem us and to make us one body, one bread in Christ. We thank you for your blood that was shed for us to wash us and to make us clean and to take away the guilt of our sins so we can serve you without fear all the days of our life. We celebrate you. We, we proclaim your death until you come in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Children are dismissed into nursery if they haven't already gone. You can keep them in in service if you'd like to. But we do have a nursery. Hallelujah. The title of this message today is Finding Water in Dry Places. Finding Water in Dry Places. Would you pray with me and ask the Lord to bless the word? Father, I need you, I need you desperately, Lord, to quicken me and to show me which way to go with this message. I know there's things that you've revealed to me that I'm not sure should be part of this message or save for another time, and I ask you to make that clear to me as I preach, that I would be led by your spirit, not by my own decision-making ability, but by the spirit of the living God. I pray that you would be exalted and lifted up, that your word would, would magnify your name, that your word would feed many today, Lord, both here in the sanctuary and those listening online. I pray that you would open our ears to hear the voice of the Son of God and that in hearing, we would be strengthened. In hearing, we would have life. In Jesus' name, amen. Finding water in dry places. Would you stand for the reading of the word, the initial reading, to honor the word of God? Genesis 21, 12 through 19. But God said to Abraham, Do not let it be displeasing in your sight because of the lad, or Ishmael, or because of your bondwoman, Hagar. Whatever Sarah has said to you, listen to her voice, for in Isaac your seed shall be called. Yet I will make I will also make a nation of the son of the bondwoman because he is your seed. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread 
and a skin of water, and putting it on her shoulder, he gave it and the boy to Hagar and sent her away. Then she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba, and the water in the skin was used up. And she placed the boy under one of the shrubs, and she went and sat down across from him at a distance of about a bow shot, for she said to herself, let me not see the death of the boy. So she sat opposite him and lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the lad. Then the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said to her, What ails you, Hagar? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him with your hand, for I will make of him a great nation. Verse 19. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the lad a drink. You may be seated. So Hagar is sent out of the house of Abraham because her son is not the son of promise. And she's only given a piece of bread and a and a skin of water that's put on her shoulder. Who knows how much water that could hold, maybe a gallon. And she goes into the wilderness, and the water runs out. And she realizes there's no water around. And she comes to the conclusion that in this dryness, in this desperate place, that she and her son are going to die. And so she sets Ishmael off a distance, a bow shot away under a bush, And she sits away from him, facing the other way, saying, I can't bear to see the death of my son. And she lifts up her voice and she weeps. And then she hears the voice of God speak to her from heaven and says, what's going on, Hagar? Why are you crying? I've heard the voice of the boy. I heard the the voice of a praying child. And I'm going to make of him a great nation. Don't lose heart, Hagar. You're not abandoned. In this dry place, you're not forgotten in this place where it looks like everything is lost. And it says in verse 19, Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. Praise God. In our times of dryness and crisis, there is always a well of water in close proximity. We just need God to open our eyes to see it. Do you see that the well was there? The well wasn't magically made there. It was there, but she didn't know it was there until God opened her eyes to see it. Hagar was crying in despair, and God saw her. But it was the prayer of her son that caused God to open her eyes to see the hidden provision. Prayer opens your eyes to see the well of water. Prayer opens your eyes to see the need that you, the, the, su- the supply of the need, the provision of the need. And here it was a well. God leads us into dry seasons in the wilderness to cause us to cry out for the living water. It may seem like we're in a barren place with the water so far away and so far out of reach. She, she may have thought there's not water for 10 miles. It may seem like God has abandoned us to a dry place. We feel discouraged, but God says, cry out, pray, and look around. I'm not far from you. The well of Christ follows us as believers wherever we go. Water is near. Cry out in faith and find the saving, refreshing water of Jesus Christ. If you're not born again, Jesus said, if anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Let him come to me. I'm a well of living water. He'll find a well that will satisfy him, that he'll never thirst. Is he saying you'll never get thirsty? He'll say, no, you'll never be far from the well that if you, when you cry, when you look for it, the water is there. I'm there to satisfy you. I'm there to give you life. John 7, 37 and 38 says, On the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus said, I'm the well, and I will live in you when you believe in me. When you come to me and you're born again, I'll become a well that's not somewhere out in the distance, but a well inside. 
that will flow out like rivers of living water. Genesis 21, 20. So God was with the ladder, with Ishmael, and he grew and he dwelled in the wilderness and became an archer. I love it. it I, in, in, earlier in the verse, it says that she, he told Hagar, he said, go to the lad and lift him up. Go to the lad, lift him up, hold him with your hand, and I will make him a great nation. That's your job as parents. That's my job as a parent. It's to go to our children to lift them up and to guide them in the right way. That's all she had to do is guide him in the right way and then pray, trust him into God's hands. And, and Ishmael became a great nation. Listen, God was with Ishmael even though he represented the natural seed of Abraham. He was cast out of Abraham's house because he wasn't the son of the promise. But if God was with the son who was cast out, how much more will he be with us, the children of promise? Exodus 15, 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. This was right after coming off their great victory of their deliverance from the Egyptians through the Red Sea. Often we come down from our mountaintop experiences only to enter right into a test. Did you ever experience that? It's like, I just had this great time with God. I was just praising him, and now I'm in this massive struggle and trial and test. That's what they experienced. They went three days, and then they found no water. Don't be surprised to come from abundant waters, like the waters of the Red Sea, into dryness. They went from a sea of water into a dry wilderness. Look at verse 23. Now when they came to Marah, so they're traveling. They know they're thirsty, and they see water in the distance. And they come to Marah, which means bitter. They come to Marah, and they're all excited. Oh, there's water. Thank God. We're not going to die of thirst. It says when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the, the name of it was called Mara. Imagine seeing that water in the distance, coming to it with, e with eagerness, with excitement, then putting the water to your mouth, and it's bitter, and you go, Pfft. you spit it out, and you say, I can't drink it. I can't even drink this water. You can't even swallow it. Listen, bitter waters are a place of disappointed expectations. We hope for the blessing of clean water to quench our thirst, but we find it bitter. This is a great picture of how we often look at the natural blessings of this life to satisfy our deepest longings. It's the young man who thinks, if I can only find the blessing of a wife, my loneliness will be satisfied. It's the young woman who longs and prays for the blessing of children. It's the young person who says, I'm going to work hard. I'm going I'm to climb the ladder. I'm going to get that promotion. If only I can get that raise, if only I can get this opportunity, I'll be satisfied. Listen, water is good. Marriage is good. Children are good. Getting a promotion is good. None of these things are, are evil. They're gifts from God. But natural blessings can never satisfy heart thirst. Did you hear that? Natural blessings can never satisfy heart thirst. Our hearts long for what really satisfies. And only things touched by heaven quench our thirst. Only things with the touch of God, with his presence, quench our thirst. Natural things without the blessing of Christ eventually leave us empty and disappointed. They leave a bitter taste in our mouth. This is where believers can stumble into complaining that God's provisions don't meet our needs. Verse 24 says, And the people complained against Moses, and they said, What shall we drink? We came to this water, and it's bitter. The people quickly gave up on the bitter water, and they asked for something else to satisfy their thirst. They had hope. They had no hope that the water could change from bitter to drinkable. 
And that's what Christians do with a shallow understanding of Christ, with an immature perspective. They, they, they experience some natural blessing and they say, ah, this doesn't satisfy me. In fact, it's turned bitter. I'm going to look for something else to fill me, something else to satisfy me. I'm, I'm done with that. I'm, I'm moving on from that. I'm abandoning that. They were abandoning the bitter waters. They said, this is undrinkable. And we can understand that. But look what it says. <clears throat> Verse 25. And so Moses cried out to the Lord, And the Lord showed him a tree. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statute and an ordinance for them. Excuse me. And there he tested them. Moses wisely called out to God whenever he didn't know what to do. This is a great picture of good leadership, good spiritual leadership. Leaders are not called to have all the answers, but to 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 know where to find them. I don't have all the answers. In fact, I have almost none. But I know where to find them. I know how to get on my knees before God and say, God, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to lead these people. I don't know what they need on Sunday or Wednesday. But Lord, I know you do. So I'm coming to you. My eyes are on you. And guess what? He's a God that never fails the humble. He's a God that always hears the one that comes to him in lowliness and just says, God, I need you. That's what Moses did. Praise God. Praise the Lord. So it says the Lord showed him a tree. Do you, do you see the tree? Do you see the picture? Do you see the New Testament picture? The Lord showed him a tree. Do you see what Moses saw? This is a beautiful picture of the cross. It's a beautiful picture of the cross. The tree that Moses put in the water represents the cross. It looks forward to what Christ would do at Calvary for his people to turn the bitter waters sweet, to take that which is undrinkable and to make it pure and sweet and lovely and nourishing. Glory to God. When he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. The answer to all our bitter waters is Jesus' cross. What is the hope for your bitter marriage? The cross. Jesus' work at the cross. We want to move on. We say, oh, this was sweet, a little sweet in the beginning, but now it's turned bitter. I want to move on. Where do we look? God, give me something else. Give me a better marriage. Give me a better relationship. He says, no, I'll turn the bitter thing sweet. You apply the cross to it. Hallelujah. Stop looking for a different drink to satisfy your thirst and see the cross. But Moses didn't just see the tree. He grabbed and picked up the tree. He embraced the tree and then he cast it into the bitter place, into the bitter waters. It's not enough to see that the answer's in the cross. It's not enough to agree theologically that the cross is the answer. You must embrace the cross. You must touch the cross. And you must apply the cross to your life and to whatever is bitter in your life. Hallelujah. Some of you might be saying, Amen, Aaron. Uh, My marriage, it it is bitter, and my spouse needs to see and to embrace the cross. This is exactly what they need. In fact, they're not here, and I'm going to send them a, a copy of this message. Praise God. They need to die to their pride, and they need to see how they've hurt me and how they've made my life bitter. I'm so glad you're preaching this, Aaron. No, my friend. God is looking for you to see your need for the cross to be embraced by you. For your bitter heart to be made sweet by the cross. God always starts with you. He starts with me. Pointing the finger at others is always condemned by God. Pointing the finger at others and blaming others keeps the water bitter. Yeah, you can think it's never going to change. Well, it's not until you humble yourself, until you embrace the cross. That's when the cross releases its power, when it's embraced when it touches the bitter things of our lives. 1 Kings 8, Solomon said this. He said, when when everything is catastrophic, when there's famine, when there's pestilence, when there's mildew and locusts and grasshoppers, when the enemy's in the gates and, 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 and 
There's plague and there's sickness. He says, verse 38, wherever, whatever prayer, whatever supplication is made by anyone or by all your people, Israel. Listen, when each one or each person knows the plague of their own heart, of his own heart, and spreads out his hands toward this temple... Then here in heaven your dwelling place and forgive and act and give to everyone according to all his ways whose heart you know for you alone know the hearts of all the sons of men. Solomon said when everyone knows the plague of his own heart not the plague of their spouse's heart or their son or their daughter their parent their father their co-worker their boss not the plague of their heart the plague of their own heart. And they spread out their hands and they begin to pray. Then I'm going to hear. God says, Solomon says, then you're going to hear in heaven. You're going to forgive. You're going to act. It's going to be power. There's going to be change. Jesus said, if you see a fault in your brother, first get the plank out of your own eye, like the log, right? Get the log out of your own eye so you can see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It's not that there might not be something wrong in your brother, your sister, your spouse. But there's probably something much bigger in your own eye that you've got to deal with first in order to help your brother, your sister, your spouse. The honesty and humility of seeing our own faults and admitting them to others does more to soften hearts than any argument justifying our own actions ever could. We want to argue, we want to do, do, my position's right, I'm right. I, let's, let's humble ourselves. That's where there's power. Second Chronicles 7, 14 is a famous passage. I'm sure it was prayed at many capitals yesterday when people gathered to pray. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place listen we have prayer night prayer meeting uh, at six o'clock on Sundays we want God's ears to be open to our prayers we don't want to come here just to hear each other prayer pray prayers I mean that's boring I want to come and believe a God that actually hears our prayers and acts. And he says, I'm that God. That's who I am. But there's conditions. You've got to see the plank in your own eye. You've got to humble yourself. You've got to pray and seek my face and repent of your own wicked ways. And then I will hear. My ears will be attentive to, this, to the prayers made in this place. My eyes They'll be open. Praise God. God will say, now you have my attention. I'm not interested in religion, guys. I'm not interested in going through motions or looking a certain way. I'm interested in a connection and a relationship with this living God. That's, that's why I'm here, to, to share this with you, to grow in it myself. Praise God. God is saying, now you have my attention, and I will pour water on the dry ground again. I will begin to heal not only your heart, your marriage, your children's relationship with you, but your nation. I'll heal your land. Isn't that what we need in America? That's where it starts. It starts in the individual, and it goes into the family, and it goes into the church, and then it spreads to the land. That's God's desire. I want to... I wanna, I want to stay here at the bitter waters turning sweet a little bit longer. Because it's not just bitter marriages that the cross heals. It's every form of bitterness in the human heart. It's everything that, that is contaminated in the human soul by the fall. You see, the cross came, Jesus came to take those contaminants out and to make our water pure, to make us drinkable. That's what Jesus came to do. When Jesus came, he took the sins of the world upon himself. When Moses put that, that tree in the waters, that tree absorbed the source of the contamination. Whatever was polluting the water was soaked up into the log or the tree. And now the, the waters were healed. That's what the cross does. It's not just forgiving our sins. It's changing our nature.
The other day I was at a store and the, the salesman that was helping me buy a suit coat, which I didn't wear today because it's kind of warm. But as the man's talking to me, he, he just kind of opens up with me and he, he, I somehow came to about that I told him I was a pastor because he asked what I did or what I was wearing the suit coat for. And he's like, oh, and he's like, oh, I'm a Christian. And, and so we started talking and he started opening up and he says, well, I'm gay. And he said, I'm done with going to churches where, where they make me feel bad about myself. I'm done with giving my money to those kinds of places. And he told me about his history and the churches that he grew up in and, and the holiness churches that he was in. And, and he shared with me a real battle. And I just listened to him. He shared with me the battle of, of feeling like the, the church made homosexuality a worse sin than others. And like everyone is pointing the finger. And... And he shared with me the battle and the struggle of, of going to uh, altars and, and praying and repenting and confessing, going to special meetings, you know, going to revival meetings and trying to get it all out there and, and, and waking up in the morning and saying, I, I still feel gay. I still feel the same way. And at some point in his journey, he gave up. And he said he heard a voice. He said he, God spoke to him and said... There's nothing wrong with you. And in saying that, we'd be saying embrace your homosexuality, embrace the way you are. The idea is that's how I made you. There's nothing wrong with you. And I want to tell you something that the heart is not to be trusted. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, says God. I, I test the heart. Anything that comes to your heart as you think is the voice of God must be weighed and compared to the scriptures. The word of God is our standard, right? And the word of God doesn't change. We can't add to it or take away from it. And, and so I listened to this man and, and he said, well, I, I found a church where the pastor basically accepts, accepts what I believe and accepts where I'm at and I'm very happy. It's a wonderful thing. And he said, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm done with kind of with that struggle and I'm happy where I am. I'm getting married to a man and whatever, a year or something. So I listened to him and, and he says, well, what do you do with that? And what do you say to that? And it's like, wow, that's a lot. <laughs> it's a heavy load right there. And, and not to start preaching at him right in the store, but, and, and I didn't want to preach at him and I, and I wanted to have compassion on him and listen to him. But I said, the thing that comes to my mind is that Jesus said, if anyone will follow me, let him come after me. Let him, what? take up his cross and deny himself and follow me. Now, Jesus didn't call any person to a life of pleasure, to a life of ease and comfort. One of the things he said was, you know, I am a normal, I have a normal biology and I, you know, it, it, it's not fair that if, if homosexuality is wrong or a sin that I now have to live a life that I can't enjoy those, those pleasures that other people get to enjoy in, in, in relationship, in heterosexual relationship. And his, his basic theme was, you know, I tried. I came to God, I prayed, I repented, I had people do deliverance on me and I wasn't changed. So I came to the conclusion and I heard this that it's okay. There's nothing wrong with me. The word of God doesn't change. It doesn't change. There isn't a cultural, you know, he said, well, the culture's changed and, and maybe there's, you know, it's context. And look, I just was like, I'm going to refresh myself in this. I wasn't changed by what he said, but I'm going to refresh myself on this. Just went back to the word of God and looked up the Greek, looked up the Hebrew. And it's not contextual, it's clear that a man to lie with a man or a woman to lie with a woman is abomination to God. Well, but Jesus didn't say anything about homosexuality. Well, he did say something about marriage. A man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife. Marriage is a man and a woman. So he did address it, and Paul addressed it, and he made it very clear, made it very clear. And the, and the idea is, well, in Leviticus... In Leviticus, I've heard this, he didn't say this, but I've heard this, you know, it talks about the Jews not eating shellfish. One of the laws was they couldn't eat shellfish, and then the next verse is talking about forbidding homosexuality. So we know that we can eat shellfish now, the, that the ceremonial law has been done away with in Christ, so hasn't that been done away with too? No, my friend, it hasn't. The Bible says we're to rightly divide the word of truth. 
to be able to understand when the scripture is saying one thing here and this something here doesn't apply anymore because it's ceremonial law, but God's moral law does stand. Back up to Leviticus 18. Read it yourself today. It's an excellent passage. God declares why he wiped out seven nations in the land of Canaan. People also say, with God is love, why did he wipe out seven nations? Men, women, and children. Kill them all. Why would God do that? Read Leviticus 18. He says, you shall not practice the practices of the people of the land. This is what they did. And he goes through a list of their sins. And he said, because of this, I cast them out. And you know within that list are sins that are not listed in the New Testament? They're not in the New Testament. The details are not in the New Testament. But he lists sexual sins and he says, these are sins that you shall not do. These are the practices of the people. I'm going to give you some of them. Sleeping with your father's wife or not your mother but your stepmom. Is that in the New Testament? It's not. Is that still forbidden? Yes, it is. Sleeping with your, any relative, your aunt, your daughter-in-law, your son-in-law, uh, your, your grandchildren, a pedophilia. All that stuff is laid out. Laid out in Leviticus 18. Would any logical thinking person read that and say, that doesn't apply today, I can do that? Of course you wouldn't. That reveals the heart of God. It reveals what's in God's heart, his eternal law, his moral law. It says, do not do these things. It's an abomination. Don't sleep with your neighbor's wife. It's an abomination. Or it's, it's uncleanness. Don't lie with a man as a, as a man lies with a woman. It's an abomination. God's heart hasn't changed. You understand that? Now, most of those passages had to do with heterosexual sin. The church should be very careful that we're not doing this to the homosexual, but we're doing this to the homosexual. That we're inviting them to the same cross that we find victory in. Do you understand that? We're inviting them to the same place where not only our sins are forgiven, but the, the nature has changed. Now, I want to say this. I believe that God's spirit changes the nature he gives us a new nature. But I also believe we have an old nature that we wrestle against. Do you understand that? It's been crucified. It's been mortified. And Paul says, mortify, therefore, the deeds of your flesh. Put them to death so they don't reign over you. Even though you're born again, you're crucified with Christ. You're raised with Christ. Christ is in you and you're in him. You need to take those old things to the cross. You need to take that old bitter stuff to the cross. I want to say there are people in this house today, probably more, that are struggling with heterosexual lust. Men, it's more common with men. It's not that women don't struggle with unclean sexual thoughts or temptations. But there are more people struggling with that. And they've prayed and you've fasted and you've, you've prayed and you've, you've sought God. And, and guess what? Sometimes you wake up the next morning and you say, it's still there. I mean, the battle is still there. I'm still the same. I, I, I repented, I got clean, but, but I feel like I'm still bent this way. You can, you can relate to the homosexual man that says, well, I, I came to an altar, I prayed, I went to special meetings, we raised our hands, we clapped, we shouted, we cried, and, and I still feel the same. You know what my answer is to that? Keep going to the cross. Keep embracing the cross. The fact is, the cross message has been lost in modern Christianity that God calls us to take those sinful desires, the bitterness, whether it's lying or it's an angry, you, you say, oh, I'm Irish and I just get angry all the time. No, it's, it's your nature. It's your sin. You just got to take it to the cross. It's, it's bitter waters that need to be healed and made sweet. And God can do it. Whether it's anger or it's lust or it's pride or it's depression, take, believe that when you bring these things and you apply the cross to them, there's freedom. There's victory at the cross. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes, praise God. There's victory at the cross. I've experienced it. 
I've experienced feeling bound to lust in my heart, and I've experienced my victory was not in trying harder. It wasn't in beating myself down. It was looking to the cross of Jesus Christ. It was the grace of God applied to me through that cross. It made the bitter water sweet. Praise God. But you know what? If I wake up tomorrow and, I, and my body and my flesh say, oh, there's a beautiful woman. You should lust after her. I have to make a choice to still take that thought captive to make it obedient to Christ and take it back to the cross. And I'm telling you, my friends, when I do that, I find victory every time. I find victory every time in Jesus. So I would say to that man, the answer is in the cross. The answer, if you have to live the rest of your life celibate, if you have to live the rest of your life taking homosexual desires captive to make them obedient to Christ, do it. Jesus Christ is worth it. Do it. Do it. Do I believe personally that the Lord Jesus Christ, through the victory of his cross, will be applied to a person who does that and change the desires? I do. I do believe that. But I think about the three Hebrew children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they stood before Nebuchadnezzar, and he said, bow down to this 90-foot golden statue that I have made for myself at the sound of the music. Bow down to it. And when he found out that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would not bow down, he was furious. And he came to them and he said, look, I'm giving you an opportunity. Is it true that you haven't bowed down? Is it true that you haven't bowed down to my idol, my false system? This is easy. You could, you, he didn't say this, but you could bow down to this idol and still bow down to your God. It's not how it works in God's kingdom. We serve one God. We don't bow down to other gods. We don't bow down to our lusts. We don't bow down to our sensual or worldly desires. We bow down to Christ alone. And what did the men say? They said, O king, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. Our God is able to deliver us from this fire. Our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your God. My friend, if you have to battle some temptation, something in your flesh, the rest of your life, be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and say, if God is able to deliver me, God is able to make bitter waters straight, God is able to make crooked things straight, God is able, but if he doesn't, if I have to fight this thing until I see him in glory, I will not bow down to this God. I will not turn back to the ways of this world. I will not find a preacher to tell me what I want to hear. But I will serve this living, risen Christ because there is power in the cross. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So I want to close with just a couple verses. Galatians 5. 18 through 23 it says, but if you are led by the spirit, you're not under the law. How do we get victory over those crooked things, those bents, the sins that seem so stubborn, the patterns we don't want to tell anyone about or confess, and the God says, bring it to the light so you can get prayer and be healed. How do we, how do, we do it? Well, how do we, what does it look like to walk in the spirit? It's simple trust in Christ. It's trust in his work, trust in his spirit, trust in him to give us victory through the cross. If you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do or practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Those that embrace those sins and say, oh, this is just the way I am. There's nothing wrong with me. They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Listen to 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus 
have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Glory to God. Those that belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And I would say they continue to mortify the deeds of the flesh. That's what it says in Colossians. Put to death the things that pop up in you. Put to death those things that are not like Christ. Put those things to death so that Christ can rise in you. Verse Romans 6, 8, 16 to 18 says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves servants to obey? You are that one's slaves or servants whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or, or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked, though you were the slaves or servants of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which, to which you were delivered. You obeyed that truth that says the cross is the answer. Jesus' victory is your answer. Not you, not the law, not trying harder, the cross. You obeyed it from the heart. Look at verse 18. And having been set free from sin, you became what? Servants of righteousness. The cross still changes lives. The cross still heals bitter waters and makes them sweet. Glory to God. Let's pray. A worship leader, if you come up. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name that there is water in dry places and there is a cross that turns bitter water into sweet water. Lord, I thank you that we are not left to be a defeated people. We are not left to be a people that whose waters remain bitter, Lord, who maybe they get a cup and that cup is made sweet, but the rest, the source is bitter. But Lord, we are a people that you've called to walk in liberty. We are a people you've called to walk in freedom. You came to break the chains of iniquity and to set the captives free. And Lord, I want to pray for us as a church that we would believe you. I pray that us as a church, that we would not say, this is how I am. I've always been this way. I've prayed. I haven't gotten victory. Lord, we need to bring these things to the cross and the cross to them. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. There is a new life in us, and that is the life of Jesus Christ. In the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God, I thank you that you're not speaking to your people in condemnation. You're not speaking to us to, to, to rub our face in where we're still struggling, but you're speaking hope to us, God. You're speaking hope that there is water when we don't even know it, when we feel dry and we feel like it's so far away, you open our eyes to see a well. And Lord, when you lead us to bitter waters, Lord, it's to make them sweet. I pray for marriages today, Lord, where people have not made progress, Lord, where, the, where they have just said, I want to give up on this marriage. I want to walk away from this marriage. It's bitter. I don't love this person anymore. Lord, I'm asking in Jesus' name that you would apply the beautiful cross, that they would embrace the cross and you would apply your victory of the cross to their marriage, to their heart. Need humble hearts, Lord, that you'd grant repentance and you'd grant healing through the cross of Jesus Christ, that marriages would be saved, marriages that are bitter would be made sweet, words that come out that are bitter would be turned into sweet words of kindness and love and forgiveness. And I pray for men and women that are dealing with sexual sin in a bent, Lord, that they're ashamed of. And God, they, they want to believe, they want to have victory, God, but they, they don't know how. And Lord, you're saying, look at, my, look at the cross. Look at it. Embrace it. Pick it up. Feel it. Hold it to yourself and apply it to your heart. Apply it to your life. Hallelujah. I want to open this altar for any that want to come and pray. 
over anything the Holy Spirit was speaking to you about. The purpose of an altar is not because there's something magical that happens here. It's a place to do business with God. It's just a place to pray. It's a place to get a hold of God. It's the woman reaching out to Jesus for his garment saying, I got to touch him. I just got to touch him. So would you, would you rise to your feet and come to this altar if Jesus has spoken to you and you just, want to, you just want to believe him again to make bitter things in your heart sweet. You want to believe him again that you're not going to stay where you're at. You're not going to stay in dryness. You're not going to stay in bitterness. But that Jesus' cross is the answer. His work at Calvary is still the answer. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
What riches of kindness He lavished on us His blood was the payment His life was the cost We stood neath the debt We could never afford Our sins they are many His mercy is more Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, it's new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy is more. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, it's new every morn, our sins they are many, His mercy Sins they are many, but His mercy is more. Know that the, the cross is the greatest act of mercy and love. And it is when you look to the cross, you should feel no condemnation. That is the Savior's love for you. That was his sacrifice to not only forgive your sins, but to give you victory and deliverance from everything that held you captive. And in the midst of your struggle, just keep looking to the cross. Failure comes when you look to yourself and you think, I got to do it. I got to change myself. You're going back to the law. We're not under the law, but under grace. We are under grace, and it's by the Spirit that we walk with Him. It's by the Spirit that we have victory. And the moment we confess our failures to Him, we are washed white as snow. We are not in probation. We are received. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy. Thank you for your mercy, God. Praise you, God. Help us, Lord, to humble ourselves, but, Lord, not to stay in a state of dejection, not to stay in a state of sorrow, but, Lord, to rise to a place of praise, to rise to a place of worship, because, Lord, your word says the joy of the Lord is our strength. So, Lord, we just thank you today that you're not looking on us with condemnation, but with love and with cleansing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but only trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, you're my cornerstone, we made strong in Savior's love through the storm. Darkness seems to 
fountain of living waters. God, we thank you in Jesus' name that you're the one that turns our bitter waters sweet. You don't say give up on that, that, that situation, give up on that marriage, give up on yourself. You say, come to me, let me apply my cross, embrace my cross, and I will turn the bitter things sweet. God, we bless you today. We thank you today. We rejoice in you, Jesus, for the change that you're bringing in our lives through believing the word of God. Lord, I just bless these people as they go. I pray that the grace of God, the love of Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit would go with every person in this place in Jesus' name.